All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, this spontaneous session of Augmented Intelligence Workshop. Um, we Today, we have a little different structure. We only have one speaker, uh, David Sumter, and he'll be talking about four ways of modeling uh, collective behavior. And then we'll have 20 to 30 minutes of uh, questions afterwards. Okay, fantastic. Uh, will I just get going then? Um, yes, well, thank you very much um, for the uh, it's a great pleasure. I, I feel, feel slightly late uh, because of this late, but, okay, but I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to come and talk to this. And it's a very nice format that we're going to have this. That I'm going to present first, and then we're going to have a discussion. So what I've tried to do is give a sort of loose idea of something. So this whole idea I, I'm going to talk about with four different ways of modeling, I wouldn't say it's some sort of completely rigorous idea, but it's just something that I've been thinking about a lot and I wanted to kind of test it out on you guys um, and we can have a discussion about it afterwards. But to just tell you first a little bit about my background. So I'm an applied mathematician and I kind of pride myself in applying mathematics to almost everything to do with, especially to do with behavior, animal behavior was what I've worked with in many years. Um, I've written a paper with Rob Collective on Wisdom of the Crowds, and um, I've worked on human collective behavior as well. And then in, in more recent years, I have also been working on the sport of football. Now that is soccer to you guys, which I think is, unlike the American version, soccer is the most beautiful collective sport because it's very fluid. There's just movement all of the time by a group of players and there isn't this sort of stop start. So uh, I, that's why it attracted my interest in the first place. And I don't have so many examples about it in this talk, but if you want to ask me about, a bit about my soccer modeling work at the end, I'm very happy to talk, talk about that. So that's, that's my background. And what I'll do now is I'll, I'll, um, well, I'll do my talk. Um, good, so here is what we've got. Four ways of modeling collective behavior. Okay, so what was the starting point? Well, the starting point is, I, you know about this, you can put your hands up or thumbs up if you've heard of this uh, book. Um, this is a book by Stephen Wolfram that actually came out about 20 years ago now. And it was started on work that he did even 20 years before that, so 40 years ago, looking at the properties of cellular automata. And what he did in this first paper he wrote on this is he, he tried to categorize the world uh, every system as being of one of four different types. And the first one he has is sta stable. And an example of that, wait, I'm sorry, I'm just going to make you smaller there. Um, stable is an example of that is a damp damped pendulum. It's just swinging backwards and forwards. And then it eventually comes to rest. A ball rolling down the hill does the same thing. Periodic systems, they're things like predator-prey cycles, anything that goes round and round, neuronal firing, we're going to look at an example of that later. Then chaotic, chaotic systems, well, they're things like the weather, we know that that's chaotic. Uh, insect populations, there was a lot of work on that in the 70s. Economics, we might think about. And then finally, complex, and that includes human behavior, society, organs in the body. Now, I'm not going to go too much into how you do these different classifications. Of course, it's by no means, and Wilfram doesn't argue himself, that it's a solid um, basis for everything, or it's, it's a, a completely fixed basis for everything. But he illustrates it nicely using four models, um, using, these different, using these cellular automata models. Now, the cellular automata model does the following. So you have to think of a line like we have of black and white squares. And what we do is we apply a transition rule to these. So the rule says that if we have three black squares in the line above, we make it black. So you see here's a row of three black, so it comes black. If we have white, black, black, it goes to white. So here's white, black, black, it goes to white. Uh, white, white, black, white, white, black goes to black. And we apply, employ over a series of steps these rules and we look at the pattern which comes out of it. And his, his argument is, and it's true for elementary cellular automata of this type, is that there are these three types of patterns. So I haven't done a, a pattern of class one stable 
everything just goes black or it just goes white. But here's the class two example. It becomes this oscillating, almost checkable pattern of black and white if you use these rules. Here's an, and here's an example of class three. So same type of rules. We've got our black and white um, rules here, only eight, always eight rules. But now we get quite an imag amazingly, well, I'm not going to say complicated because he said it's chaotic. We get this amazingly chaotic looking pattern. And the reason he classifies this as chaotic is if, if you follow the order of black and white cells in the middle of this cellular automata, it is more or less as close to random as you possibly can get. So you get this random sequence in the middle. And that's what he calls class three. That's the chaotic, chaotic one. And then class four is another type that he found. And this is called rule 110. And what it does is it produces these kind of structures. So if you look carefully here, you see this sort of like band moving very slowly to the left. And there's other bands which are moving more quickly to the right. And when they collide with each other, they change and they turn into other bands. And so here's a little bit further into this pattern. Again, we're just using simple set transition rules, the ones that we set up at the start. But now there's a kind of sort of infinite zoo of different patterns that come out of this. There's these different um, bands. I think they've still failed to classify all the different structures that could come out of this. But there's these little bands and they some of them are stationary. Some of them are moving, moving with different speeds. And when they crash into each other, they change and they, they move into different directions. And so these patterns are what you might call complex patterns. Now, what I, I liked about this idea, I, I think another talk, I might go a bit more into how it's applied in the physical world. But I wondered if we could actually apply it to the way that we do modeling. Now, I do all sorts of different types of modeling in my work, and I've found that basically when I approach a modeling problem, I can break them down into one of these four categories. So one is statistical, one is terms of interactions, one is chaotic, and one is complexity. So what I'm going to ask you now to do is indulge me a little while I give a few random examples of these uh, these types of patterns. So let's start with the statistic one. This uh, was a big departure for me to do this modeling, but I became very interested in research to do with predicting personalities from Facebook likes. And this was actually, we're going to come to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. I'm going to tell you this is relevant to it, but this, I started being interested in this before the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke out. Uh, because there was a paper written in 2015 by uh, Michael Kosinski. And what he did is he asked, he, he sent out, before, before Facebook had a lot of things you could do on it, he sent out a questionnaire on Facebook where he measured people's personalities in these five different standard categories. This is quite a, a reasonably good test of personality where you can cast a, you do principal component analysis, on the answers to these 100 questions, and you can categorize people on scales of openness, neuroticism, agreeableness, extroversion, and conscientiousness. And so he sent out those these questionnaires and got loads of people to answer it. And then what he could do is he could correlate, using a regression model, the likes of people on Facebook, what they were liking on Facebook, and their personality. He put it all into a regression model, again, using some principal component analysis, and linked, made a link between these two things, the things that they liked, and the conscious, conscientiousness, openness, and so on. Now, this is just, it's quite funny, because it's like, um, it just comes out with a sort of uh, list of prejudices, basically. And um, it finds that the outgoing people, where they like dancing, theater, and beer pong, so this is the personality is outgoing, the uh, dancing theater and beer pong is their um, their favorite things. You all know what beer pong is. I, I didn't know what beer pong was when I started uh, doing this, but I think uh, probably you've all played beer pong apparently at one time in your lives, if you're Americans. And um, But shy people, as I say, very stereotyped here. They like anime, role-playing games, and Terry Pratchett books. Um, neurotic people, they like Kurt Cobain, emo music, and they say, sometimes I hate myself. And finally, 
calm people apparently like skydiving, football, and business administration. The last one I understand, but skydiving being calm, I've, I haven't quite got, but there seems to be a, a link between those, those um, categories. And you don't have to like all of these at the same time. So you might just like skydiving and business administration, um, and then that would show something towards being a calm person. Now, what happened, and I mentioned this already, is that Cambridge Analytica picked up on this particular research project because what this, this person, Alexander Nix, said in particular was he said, well, I can identify all of the neurotic people in the United States of America, and I'll be able to, um, using this skill, my using the fact that they're neurotic, I'll be able to manipulate their voting patterns. So you can target neurotic people with messages like they should protect their, fa their family with a gun. And those types of things will really work for them. And this all in the end uh, was his dastardly plan, but there was a whistleblower, Chris Wiley, who revealed that this was going on. And then that resulted in what became the Cambridge Analytica study. Now, I think this is all very interesting, but at the same time, this is the correlation, right? So when they fitted the regression model, I've taken a hundred points here, which typically reflect the correlation they found in the data between neuroticism measured in a psychological test and neuroticism measured by Facebook data. And can you see a pattern here? Well, it's weak at best. There is a statistically significant pattern. And I think this is where we have to really think about what we, what we do as researchers, because there is a statistically significant pattern because there's lots of data. You can publish an article in PNAS on this, but I'm not sure you would rely on it to build a tool of the type that um, uh, um, Alexander Nix said he was going to do. So one measure you can do is, is uh, we can say, if I, if I pick two of you at random, and I try, try to predict which of you is most neurotic and less neurotic um, using this method, I'll be right only 60% of the time. So there's a very low accuracy because 50-50, you're on randomness, you'll, you'll, you'll get that right, but I'll just be right 60% of the time. And also it kind of mixes up like Nirvana neurotic, which was in the data, with protect your family with a gun neurotic. Uh, there isn't really a relationship between those two things. So I think a lot of the things that came up from the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal was more about this AI snake oil stuff where people say they can predict things about your life, but they're very limited about how they can predict things about your life. And this is true, I think, of many of the studies that we've seen. Maybe some of you are uh, familiar with this work on machine bias, where they showed that this was a racist algorithm classified. Or there was a lot of argument backwards and forwards about if the algorithm was racist or not. That I don't really want to touch on. What I want to touch on is this work done by Julia Dressel, where she found, she looked into the commercial software that was being used for these classifications, and she found that this, this software, which was predicting if people would uh, do crimes or not in the future, it was no more accurate and fair than the predictions of people with little to no criminal justice experience. And she did this by going onto Amazon Turk, getting people to predict if people with certain backgrounds, they have a little description of the person, did they commit crimes or not? And she found that they were just as able as any algorithm to make that guessing. And this, I think, is a general pattern, and I wrote about this in my book, Outnumbered. I've written other blog articles about this as well. But there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of like, sort of a limitation of when you do a regression model, it only picks out very weak patterns, and often it doesn't pick out patterns that you wouldn't really be able to work out yourself to some degree. And so that's my kind of overall conclusion of this type of statistical modeling. So, okay, why am I bringing up all this? Well. I think that what this is points to is statistical modeling is, is nice. It tells you a few sort of general patterns about the world, but it doesn't really get you into the details. It doesn't really sort of tell you the truth about the interactions between people or the differences between people. And to do that, you need another type of modeling. And this is what I would call interactive modeling. Now, this is what I spent a lot of my research on collective animal behavior um, doing. I'm going to give one example from human behavior here. 
This is a crowd of undergraduate students. They have just, are they going to play in this video? No, they're not going to play in this video. I can just tell you about what's, what's happened to these undergraduate students. They've just watched a seminar by a, a, their first year undergraduate students. They've just watched a seminar by a third year undergraduate student. And what we're doing is we're filming their applause after they have heard this talk. And what we found is if we looked at the change in their clapping over time, so this is time in seconds, this is from the first clap here, is the growth curve of this. You see that it grows up like this, and then eventually they stop clapping. We can look at this in a slightly different way. This is the time, or this is for each of the individuals, when was the first clap that they did. So this is the first clap by anybody. This is the second clap. Then there's a little gap here. Then everybody seems to start clapping. And then there's one person who took four seconds to, to start clapping a little bit after the other. We can also look at how people stop clapping. So here is all of the claps that they did from the first person to stop, the second person to stop, and so on. And from this, You'll all be familiar from this. You might have, these curves might look familiar to anyone who's, who's recently lived through a pandemic. What we did is we thought, well, can we, can we fit an SIR model to this data? So susceptible is people who might start clapping, infectives are people who have, are clapping, and recovered are people who have recovered from clapping. These are the equations for, for this. And if you know, if you, if you have studied something to do with, um, with, uh, SIR models and disease models, you should notice there's a difference in this last term. So what we found modeled people stopping clapping is different from real diseases. It turns out that people also stop clapping on a social basis. So for if, if I'm clapping along and the person next to me is clapping along, when I see people around me stopping clapping, then I also recover from clapping. So there's a kind of social recovery which is reflected in this term. And so we could model this, and the left is the data that we collected, the right is um, a model where we, we fitted various models and we found this social recovery, both the, there was both a social start to clapping and then there was a social recovery to clapping. One interesting thing that we found because of this, so if you think about like at the end of a, end of a talk when people do do an applause, not in this one, of course, because we're on Zoom, but in, in a real life, when um, if they go on clapping for a long period, it might not be because they're actually appreciating your talk very much. It might just be because they can't quite manage to coordinate the stop of their clapping. So um, that's something to think about when you get a particularly long, well, maybe it's a depressing thing to think about if you get particularly long applause. So that's just to give one idea of, okay, so as an interactive model. So this is this is an interactive model. This is what we do here is we kind of try to um, look, we measure these parameters, which are the um, interactions between the individuals. We use exactly the same approach as we might use if we were modeling a disease spread. And this turns out to be a very powerful approach for looking at a whole range of problems. It's finding out what the correct interaction is, measuring it, and then you can start to build a model of that particular phenomena. And a lot of my work on collective animal behavior was exactly this type of thing. This is work that we did on tracking locusts. And we were looking at their interactions and we could model them as we could model them as going one of two ways. They were either going one way around the, the arena or the other way around the arena. And those interactions led them to form collective patterns where at high densities, they'd all move in the same direction, while at low densities, they just move in one of the um, they move more randomly. Low densities, they moved at random. High densities, they all move in one direction. And in between, they switch backwards and forwards between those directions. We did lots of similar things on ant trails. This became uh, written like 20 papers on ant trails, actually. There's so many interesting things about ant trails, but I'm not going to go into, with them, into them today. But we, a, lot, a lot of the typical experiment we do is we'd have left and right choices for the ants. And we'd use that to their decision making. We'd model their decision making using these types of interactive models. This is an example with fish. This is where the fish have a little predator down one of the wings. I think, yeah, the predator's there and the fish come out of um, this. And we're interested 
how the fish decide if they're going to go left or right. This is the first one. Whoops, it's gone past the predator. And what we now we're going to get into the collective them here or the collective decision making. Now we're going to have a group and let the group out and let them swim along. And they're a bit more careful here and they make the right decision apart from one of them and manage to take the right branch. And you, oh, yeah, he's back. Um, but you actually find that these, these fish make better collective decisions when they're in groups because of their interactions. It's same sorts of things with pigeons, um, same sorts of things with some I was going to put into my talk, but I've now forgotten what it was. But uh, same, there's lots of these examples from collective animal behavior. The pigeon homing one, we were, um, we were looking at how pairs of pigeons fly home whether one leads and one follows, whether they take some sort of compromise. And we could use these types of interactive models to answer those kinds of questions. And I wanted to, <clears throat> um, so, so okay, so that sounds great. So we've got the interaction idea. Now we can maybe solve all the problems in the world. Well, it turns out that doesn't quite work because we have to remember there's chaos. And chaos arises quite easily in models and it arises quite easily in real life. And this example here I'm going to give um, is, is going to illustrate one example of this. This is data from a fish. This is a single fish that is swimming along and you see it does this burst and glide motion. So we're measuring its speed over time, burst, glide, burst, glide, burst, glide, burst, glide. And one fish will do that type of motion. When you have two fish, this is shown here. This is the velocity of the fish dependent or the speed of the fish dependent on the distance to uh, its nearest neighbor. There's two fish in this experiment. And you see that they speed up when, someone, when they've got a fish in front of them. And they also speed up when they've got a fish behind them. This is just two different types of fish rather than uh, rather than any difference. So fish speed up when they've got a fish behind them. Distance between the fish, speed that they go at. So we've got these two observations. They seem quite innocuous observations. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to build a model for the interaction of these two fish. Um, and the model we started with when we did this was the Fitzhugh-Nagumo model, which is a well model of neuronal firing. So we wanted to, we, of course, we, we're not looking exactly what goes on in the fish's brain, but we have some kind of rough idea. And what we wanted to do is capture what goes on in the fish's brain in terms of this classical model where you've got a potential difference, which is V, and you've got some sort of chemical signal, which is W. You, you model the interactions of them and you get these firing spikes. And we built that into a fish model. I'm certainly not going to go into all the equations here, but we use the same sorts of terms here, but instead of a chemical um, component, we just have the velocity of the two fish and we have a function which connects them together based on the distance between the fish. Um, and yeah, again, in another talk, I might go into all of the details of this, but basically we've got a model where you, you this fish will respond to other fish going in front of it. And what's kind of cool and interesting about these types of models is they produce a whole range of different types of dynamics. So here is the periodic, um, here is the, the long-term dynamics, and here is the short-term dynamics between the fish. So the blue and the orange ones here are the speed of the two fish. So in this case, the blue fish is leading and the orange fish is, is sorry, the orange fish is leading and the blue fish is following because the orange fish accelerates first, then the blue fish, orange fish, blue fish, orange fish, blue fish. Oh, and they've actually swapped positions. So now the blue fish is first, the orange is, is second and so on. And in this particular case, they basically take turns six times accelerating, um, six times one fish, six times the other fish, six times one fish, six times the other fish, and they have periodic leadership switching. But you can also get out of this model a very nice chaotic pattern here. So in this case, they... Sometimes one fish is leading, sometimes another fish is leading, but there's no regular pattern in who switches between the, the leadership things. And you can show that this gives a chaotic sequence, an unpredictable sequence of who the leader and who the follower is. Now, just tying back to the social dynamics, this is very important for thinking about when we 
when we want to classify who's a leader in society and who's a follower in society, this model in this particular fish model is completely chaotic. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Sometimes they switch regularly between them. Sometimes they just have, um, it, yeah, you can't predict in the near future who's going to be the leader. Sometimes there's constant leadership, of course, and sometimes there's this kind of tit for tat where there's no leadership. So that's the chaotic one. Then finally, okay, so so chaos is a is I don't know it's a problem, but it's a kind of yeah it's it's, it's a it's a problem for making predictions in the long term, which which often means that the interactive model falls down. And then we're left with complexity modeling. Well, of course, that's the most difficult of them all. And um, if you know if we had a single well, this should be a four here. If we had a single model of complexity, then we would be well. I don't know. That's impossible, actually. Probably by the definition. But uh, we don't have a single model. So what we're left with instead is a whole kind of bunch of interesting models where we simulate stuff. And this is from a few years ago from one of my PhD students, Daniel Strumball. And what Daniel did is he set up a model of um, this is a model that's just based on animals being attracted to each other in three dimensions. And they have a blind angle behind them, so they can't see behind them. And again, you can see all these different types of beautiful, complex shapes that arise out of these, these uh, rules. Sometimes you get a long string, which you often see in, in bird flocks. Sometimes you get a mill where you see fish going round. This is a shape that kind of twists and turns very like a starling flock. Here's a flying crystal where everybody seems to be going in the same um, way. And you really do get complexity. I mean, what you would genuinely call complexity out of these simple rules. And he's made a phase diagram here of the different, different types of patterns. He found in total eight different classes of patterns that came out of this system. And this is another example where we looked now again at ants. This is something that I'm going to start working on again because I, I I'm often going back to this model, but it's a beautiful model um, called current reinforcement. And the idea here is that you have an ant nest at one end and you have some food at the other end. And in this particular simulation, I'll show it again, we close off the gates here and we have a gate in the middle and you see that the ants reorganize to find the shortest path between them. And they do this just using what we call current reinforcement. So the current, the flow on any particular edge leads to an increase in the flow. And we've actually proven that whatever maze you set up for the ants, they'll be able to find the shortest path um, through these types of ants. And again, local rule producing a very nice collective pattern. We tested this on real ants. This is this experiment here. And we tested it. Um, you will maybe have seen many of these studies on slime mold. We test it on slime mold as well. Um, to to do that. One last example. I think I'm yes, I'm near to the end of my time. Um, this is uh, by a student of mine, Ernest uh, Liu Yu, and he. Let me just play his video. This will be the last thing we have. The idea here is you have reactions, and he started with like the potato plus a banana is equal to. A, so this is very, we can start with something evocative. So you can see this, as the, as the potatoes come in, uh, they can be, um, so if a potato, uh, <laughs> yes, a potato plus a, um, a, let me start the video again and try and explain it a bit better. Okay, so we have a load of potatoes here and we put in a banana. And if that potato meets a banana, it becomes a strawberry. If a strawberry meets a potato, it becomes an avocado. And an avocado splits into two more bananas. And we just live in a world where these reactions keep going on. And um, we see, well, what's going to happen in the long term. So Ernest has sped up this video now. So now we're going to start to get a lot of bananas, but there's still quite a few potatoes around. And over time, the bananas will start to grow exponentially. But what he pointed out is quite cool, is you can actually write this down in terms of different um different protein reactions or different yeah different carbohydrate reactions um hydrocarbon reactions and you get the foremost reaction which is like this potato thing but now we have it in this term 
And what Ernest did is he represented it not in potatoes and not in terms of chemical reactions, but in terms of number reactions. And he tested all the different types of number reactions that could come up and found collectively catalytic systems, self-replicating systems, um, a whole variety of different self-reproducing systems could be produced by this uh, type of thing. I think that I have this one thing which you just have to look at to um, while I summarize. In the end, I really like this idea when we come to complex systems of thinking in this way. So the, the thing at the bottom there is a complex system. And my blue thing is my attempt to model this system and capture it. And you'll notice this thing that it can never, ever capture the system as a whole. It goes around. We look at it from different angles. We try to get into it, but we never manage to capture the entirety of the system. And that is the way that I think ultimately we have to think about complex systems, that they're systems which you need lots and lots and lots of different models to sort of get at this bit and that bit. But you can never know the entirety of the truth. And I think with that message, I will stop and open for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for yep. this uh, thought provoking uh, talk. And I would uh, open up the discussion for everyone to jump in with their comments and thoughts. Uh, please feel free to raise your <clears> hand <throat> if you have a question. And I see that Rob has the first question. Do you mind? Do you mind if I just have one second to get a glass of water? Because I, yes, I didn't do yes, that. Yes, sure. I, <laughs> yeah. I just noticed I did that quite fast. <laughs> Good, now I'm ready. Okay, great. That, that was great, David. I really enjoyed your examples. Um, oh, you. So I, I kind of have a, a maybe like a philosophy of science question for mm. the, the distinction that you're drawing between um, like, I don't know, I'll call them like descriptive regression models, a la Kaczynski, mm. and your interactive models, <clears> which I think in my field, I would call process models. <laughs> um, and the, the, I totally buy the distinction. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm trying to problematize a little bit. So like, it, mm -hmm. it sometimes doesn't seem totally clear to me what something is like if I take like, uh, the power law relation between like the the number of connections that a, a person or a website has and its probability, it fits a power law. And then people like Farabashi and Alberts come along with process models, interactive models of preferential attachment that can give rise to that particular descriptive law. But but it kind mm. of makes me, I guess, first think that it's not in the equations, like the same equations could either be a descriptive law or a process model, depending upon whether you have a story for where the, the descriptive yeah. equation comes from. And two, it makes me kind of also think, well, Maybe, you know, the Kaczynski style model is not probably not something that would appeal to me directly, but I guess I could kind of see a reason for it as long. So it becomes a, a model that is an invitation to create a process model for it. Mm. Exactly. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you've su you've summarized the problem. And the examples are really is a really good one. I think um, what I would okay there's two there's two, two i mean right so there's lots of different things one thing is with the example that you've given there are often lots of different mechanisms for producing um power laws for example and so you would want to choose between lots of different mechanistic types of models um but that's one point to raise but then the overall one i think there's what i i come to when i think about this is that often the output of the model is a distribution rather than a mean. So when I'm thinking about the statistical models here, they're things for measuring means and sort of categorizing um, static type of data. 
And when you come out of these process models, they'll typically produce a distribution like a power law distribution. And that is more of the output of the model. So you see in my clapping example, I have a distribution of how people started to clap and things like that. So that's the output of the interactive model. So I would put that pretty clearly into an interactive model with a predictive power and the output of the, the output of the model is a distribution. So the output of models tend to either be a distribution or a kind of time series thing. And in your particular case, that's a distribution. So it's very much an interactive model for me, that one. Um, there was a lot more to your question now than uh, that. Um, I, I, um, you know, tell me the last part of it as well, because that was different from the, uh, from so the first So I part. guess a part of it is maybe, I, I don't want to be a justification, for these purely descriptive models, but I guess I think it's a blurry line. And so like I could see somebody maybe even just calling a linear regression model, which is basically Kaczynski's model. Yeah. If it's the kind of model that one could potentially uh, develop process models for. And I mean, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and oh, yes, linear yeah, regression yeah, yes, models do that. Yes, I, I think right. Simple. So the main point, yeah. the main point, I think, because there's a big tendency towards. I mean, there's a thing hiding in the background here, which I'm very aware of, and it's in the Kaczynski thing. It's like this AI solution and machine learning solution to the world, where basically what they're doing is repackaging statistical models as some sort of amazing magic. And that's definitely Kaczynski did that. He's really explicitly did that. And that's where it, what caused the problems, because then it was then repackaged as Cambridge Analytica as magic. So that's what I think is. a. So I, I'm very much arguing for, um, look, these models give you a tiny, tiny effect. And we, we know that from all our studies. So we when we study human behavior, we measure things and we find these tiny differences and we write an article about it. And we're aware of that, but it's not always portrayed outwardly if you want to know if you want to make more kind of understanding predictive get to the nature of things then you'll really need to use these process models in order to do that you're not going to be able to get it out just by finding these small statistical differences between between things so i think that's where my my argument or my renewed interest in this is i've spent um I've become more, I now work in a machine learning department because yeah, we were all told we, that's what I was told that's why it's apparently. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's what, that's the development here, but I've really got a reaction against that in terms of it's just basically, it, we already knew from statistics that these give weak relationships. It's not gonna matter if you call it machine learning. All right, uh, it seems like I'm next. Uh, so. Uh, it was very interesting to me that you uh, were talking about this four world frame classes of behavior, stable, mm. periodic, chaotic, <clears throat> and complex. And it seemed like originally, uh, like you were trying to link them to four different types of modeling. But then you also yeah. presented some models that seem to capture several different patterns, uh, such as in your fish example, I thought. So the model that could give rise to maybe three or four of these types of behavior and I was wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on which approach would be more uh, productive in case of collective behavior, either looking for each individual, either looking for individual types of mod models to capture four types of behavior or looking for models that could give rise to all four. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think that was one of the, so even before Wolfram, people acknowledge this like class one, two, and three. So even if you go back to like Cole Magorov, who did experiments on moving an object through water and looking at the turbulence, you could find these classes of one, two, three behavior from those types of models. And that's what we see in our, um, our fish model. We have the one, two and three classes that all come out of it. I think there's kind of like a hierarchy or there's not a hierarchy or there's a kind of ordering. You can't have. Um, and, and even in dynamical systems, a one dimensional system has a stable point, a two dimensional system can have a cycle and three dimensions can be chaotic. And so there is this kind of ordering that if you have a chaotic pattern, you can probably manage to produce a stable or a periodic pattern from those equations. Not always, but, you know, most of the time. Um, so, yes, there's definitely that is there and i suppose yeah because in a way what i said at first was stable um 
stable and statistical don't quite work together but it is kind of like this you know there's just this mean there's this mean describing the average behavior and that's the sort of stable background noise of everything and then the interactive one the reason I called it interactive is yeah, I don't know I think it's because I wanted to sort of capture this idea of the processes um, that Rob was mentioning as well that it's not just it's not just about finding a periodic pattern it's about modeling these interactions and as you say it becomes problematic then because my interactive model is then used to produce my chaotic example so it, it certainly it goes in that direction so I think I'm just really reiterating what you said it was yeah it's a good point so I, I think my question is very related maybe you sort of just answered it but I guess I was wondering what the distinction is between them like are, are they different approaches to modeling so statistical to me seems quite different from the other three but it sounded <laughs> like I could have been wrong but the other three are all interactive but then you uh, different properties emerge from the models and so sometimes it's chaotic and it's complex and sometimes it's it's not is that is that correct or or they're actually different yeah approaches? I think it is a correct it, it is correct and um I think that is actually similar to Marina's point maybe that um maybe that naming isn't maybe I should just stick to the periodic for the second type of one but I think I think okay I think the difference is this is if you've got two things right if you've got two things which are interacting and I suppose the fish have yeah you have two things which are interacting you'll only get periodic behavior then the question is well you only had two fish didn't you David but actually I had the neurons in the fish as well so I had two fish and their neurons and that became a chaotic Model. So um, it would be more more accurate to say this that there's a um, interaction of two things, interaction um, of two or more th uh, more than two things which produce chaos, or interaction of lots of things which produce complex behavior. And then you could say, well, you you could just call it interactive and and uh, non-interactive or statistical. But it but it's amazing how much you can get out of this two thing interactive model so all of the examples i showed you that we worked with with collective animal behavior they built on this principle of of having producing either periodic dynamics or bifurcation dynamics you can get an amazing amount out of those two things interacting um and so that's why i, I like to think of it as a classification of it by itself you can get a lot of stuff out of that without going over to the complexity type of thing Great. Uh, do people have any other thoughts, related or unrelated? Any other questions? Well, I do have a question that I guess Tony and I were talking about in the chat. But um, is there like a, a, a better formal mathematical way of defining random for Wolfram's class three <laughs> phenomenon? Because obviously, it's extremely predictable if that's what one means by random from the yeah. from the rule that generated it so i just am a little bit worried that it's like just kind of subjective it depends upon the patterns that people can no, that's that's see. a really good question so a mathematician would not call that random that output um it's a computer so there's become this word pseudo random um which describes the output of this because if you think about the number the random number generator on your computer well, some of them are, are actually based on the Wolfram thing, but there is is just modular arithmetic. So you just um, take a number, take the mod of it, multiply it, and just keep doing that in various so sort of cycles. And so that's producing the random numbers on your computer. So it's as random as the output of those types of number ra random number generators. But then there becomes these incredibly interesting questions to do with. Now I'm going to go back to Cole Magorov as well, but. There's comes these really incredible, interesting questions to do with um, complexity and randomness, because what Kolmogoro was, if you took a strip, you for you can find very, very long strings of zeros and ones. And as you get to very long strings, nearly all of those strings are random in the sense that there's no predictable pattern in the zeros and ones. So as you get very long, nearly everything is random. And that's what he defined as complexity. So complexity of a string is the shortest possible description of string. So the complexity of the string produced by the cellular automata um, is very, very low because I told you the rules for it. 
but the complexity of very long strings if you just for most of the strings that are very long is very high and what makes this even more difficult is that now his definition of complexity is actually the definition of randomness and so that makes it that makes this whole question um uh, yeah that, that makes it less clear as well because i want complexity to be something different and i think we want we, most of us want complexity to be something different we don't want complexity just to be a you know randomly constructed string we want complexity to be these types of patterns so in the end there is actually no mathematical definition of complexity that's satisfactory there's just this this one that kolmogorov has which is basically it's random so there's lots of different uh, definitions of randomness which do put together answer your your concerns but there's ultimately no definition of complexity in, in part of this is there a like a, a kind of a strong claim that there is no other mathematical formalization which would produce the same sequence like down the middle the middle column of a cellular automata as the the rule that produced it uh that, no there's not really that claim this this claim is more to do with um it just says of all the long strings so if you take a string that is um i don't know 200 billion 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 and you took that string and you said is that string random the answer is always yes and that's that's the result from kolmogorov and and um in the, and can i can i find an algorithm which produces that string the answer is no you can't find it produces the length of that string it's it's just going to be the absolute longest string uh it's going to be an absolutely random string you can but see in your face if there is another algorithm if there's another algorithm that produces the same or correlated output to the rule that generated it then isn't that alternative algorithm uh a, no but, but the rule i generated i generated this string i just picked i i said you know i've got these zillions and zillions of string and i'm going to take one of them and i'm going to say can i find an algorithm which reproduces it like a short algorithm which just produces that string and the answer is no um, with a very high probability this string that i've chosen will not be reproducible by a sim simple algorithm and that's just because you run out of things to you run out of stuff right so you're going to have an algorithm so the, you've got a cellular automata which produces a strip this particular string and that's nice but you run out of ways of generating strings faster than um you can all of these strings appear as you as you al allow different variations of zeros and ones in a string <laughs> okay. Sorry, my dog wants to get that. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to mention that there is uh, one type of complexity which we call temporal complexity, like the time distance between humans that they change the conversation, like time distances or the shark and fish uh, that you were saying the leadership changes over time right hmm. and so so uh, do you did you measure such a complexity uh, like what is the distribution of those times of exchanging the leadership for example or so um, for um we well we, we i mean we measured it inside the model um and we've done some experiments on these uh with the fish it's very difficult to get them in very long periods and it depends on the types of fish but we do we yeah we, we've made it, measured some of these things like how long it takes um fish to change their leadership uh but it really depends on the context actually but they they just swim around all the time changing leaderships so i think i think the, the maybe the thing is it doesn't tend to be a particularly interesting question in the context of fish swimming around in a circle who changes the leadership there are some experiments what we do think is that our our experiments call into question a lot of the game theoretic analysis of the same thing so there was a whole load of studies in the 90s where they looked at fish swimming up a channel and doing this kind of like tit for tat behavior they called it and I think also the experiment I showed with the, the group of fish all swimming together, 
I think that that really wasn't true, that there was a game theoretic thing in this tit for tat. It's just how fish swim together. They use each other's collective, they, they use this sort of in collective intelligence to make better decisions rather than having some kind of who's going to go first nearest to the predator idea. So that's right. where that type of switching has been measured and it has been useful. Yeah, so like for the surrogate data of, that you get from modeling, like swarm uh, of fish that you showed, what about those data? Could you, did you even try to see, is there any complexity? Yeah, in so um, I mean, what we did is we looked at, um, let's see if, if this is it here. So I can just show you. Um, so this is from Linnea Gillenberry's um, Licenciat half PhD thesis. We did stuff like this. We um, looked at the points at where um, the maximum points, and then we could plot those over time. And we'd also could make a bifurcation diagram where um, we'd look at the maximum and minimum distance between them and make a distribution of those types of things. So you can see the different classes of behavior coming out in these, some of them are chaotic, some of them are switching and so on. And you can start to classify the different the different types um, as a function of this coupling parameter, how tightly coupled they are together. So though, yeah, that, that's the sort of thing that we've done in the done in the model. Absolutely. So I have oh sorry, Koresh. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. So uh, mm -hmm. you are you seem to be inspired by Wolfram's four classes of behavior and trying to translate this to uh, collective behavior. And many people in complexity science really are on board with this classification. And it seems like there is no doubt it must be useful. But I was wondering if you could maybe try to play devil's advocate and think about ways in which maybe this type of conceptualization might might actually hinder us from learning about uh, collective behavior? Are there any limitations of this approach? <clears throat> that's a that's a fantastic question. And actually, the, the thing is, I'm not really on board with although I have my own classification, which I thought was, I thought it was useful for illustrating what I, how I do different areas of my research. I don't believe, and, and this relates also to Rob's question about complexity, is I think that, that I think that it's wrong, actually, the um, idea that you define complexity in this way. And I think it's wrong for the reason I illustrated in my last um, slide, which I'm just going to put up again, is for me, um, this is the definition of complexity. You have a system which has a, it has an internal component, it has interactions with other agents, it has interactions or, to the environment, and it's impossible to ever have a single closed picture of this system. And I think that the most useful definition of complexity is that one, is a system which you can never ever close or hope to close. And so that's more, I mean, it's more like a sort of I don't know if it's a postmodern definition or something like that. It's a kind of, it's certainly an anti-reductionist um, definition. And and Wolfram's theory is entirely reductionist. It's the idea that you have a single equation which defines the entire complexity of the universe. And I think that that's just nonsense. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. And it's just total rubbish. So, um, so yeah, so now I've really criticised his... Uh, <laughs> his thing i mean i think i think it's it's in that literal sense and i think that he does seem to take it literally um it's it's nonsense but in terms of a practical sense for modeling systems it can be a very useful way of seeing things excellent answer thank you so much and this seems like a natural point to end the discussion uh thanks again david for being here thanks everyone for waiting and for uh for this uh, really great discussion. And I would want to invite everyone for our next week's se session where we will hear from Celie Hayes and Jeremy Balinson, and we'll make sure they are uh, all <laughs> aware of the time switches that will be happening in next, uh, next week as well. So thanks everyone. See Thank you. you, I really enjoyed that. Thank you, bye-bye.
thanks, David. That was that was great. Um, and I'm impressed by your poise in presenting. Um, yeah, because to me.